This is the Cedar Tavern, New York's famous bar where Jackson Pollock and the abstract expressionists used to come and drink in the 1950s. Actually, it's not the Cedar, but a remake put up after the original tavern burnt down in 1963. But to this day, people still come here in search of the abstract expressionist myth, expecting to find it steaming off the tables, perhaps. Come out and fight, the abstract expressionists used to growl at each other when they met here. They'd rip the doors off the hinges. Jackson Pollock actually did that one night. And they'd punch each other and insult each other and say, I'm more sincere than you, or I'm more authentic than you, or I'm more existentially tortured than you, or I've had all your women, which was one famous insult that the art critic Clement Greenberg was supposed to have hurled at the painter Willem de Kooning in a drunken brawl. Like many of these myths, it turned out to be only partly true, as Greenberg later revealed, there was only one of de Kooning's women he liked, and that was de Kooning's wife, Elaine de Kooning. But in all this macho comedy, there was tragedy and there was pathos, and that was what was going on in Jackson Pollock's head. He was a very angry person and a very unhappy person. He'd be very subdued when he was sober, but when he had when he got drunk, then the aggression would come out and he would be very, very difficult, very aggressive. When he'd go into the cedar bar, he'd say, Are you fucking whores, you think you're painters? You don't know what, anything. His, his self-destructiveness was overwhelming. Pollock's art was a mystery art of pure abstraction. There was nothing in it except art. It made sense to him as a natural development from the Picasso system. But he found the process of getting it over to the public by playing up to the media literally mad-making. It resulted in a Pollock who was alienated from himself. Nowadays, we find it normal for modern art to be in the papers a lot and for the stories about it to be all exaggeration and rubbish, from outright jeering to accolade overdrive. But that was all new in Pollock's time. His escape from art world hysteria was his home here in East Hampton, three hours drive from Manhattan. He lived here with his wife, the artist Lee Krasner. Every week he went into New York to see his analyst and to hang around with artists and critics. And then he came back here to paint and to worry, worry about who he was and what his status was. Why was he so popular anyway? He was thought to be a wild painter, he painted on the floor because he was wild. He used cheap household paints because he was rough and tough. In fact, he used quite expensive household paints because they got the effect he wanted. He got the paint out of the tins onto the canvas in big sweeping loops using sticks or old dried up hardened brushes. But he didn't just get it all on there at once. He worked in stages, building up an image. It isn't wild art. It's deliberate, sophisticated art. It's good art. But there is wildness in it. And that's why it's great art. Spontaneity, chance, ugliness are all definitely in there, making something new, something graceful and delicate and odd, which even today we can't quite pin down, however blasé we think we are about the myth of Jackson Pollock. This is the real Pollock, really painting. But it's also the mythic Pollock, painting for the camera, like Picasso playing to the camera. Picasso was at ease with being a showman, but Pollock wasn't, perhaps because it was the wrong show for him. I always think it's odd how delicate everything looks here, how untough it all is. By the time this film was made, Pollock's dream of art had started to turn into a nightmare. Nothing was real, everything was constructed around him. I don't think that he had a terribly large ego, but he performed a lot in order to get attention. He wasn't an intellectual. He, he, was, he was charming and uh, attractive, but very shy, actually. Not a big ladies' man, that, and Lee, really dominated him, you know. 
he was submissive and she was aggressive. She was aggressive in all her relationships. Yes, but he had this old barn for a studio, but uh, 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 Lee had to work up upstairs in a small room to do her painting. That's true, but that was her choice. I mean, she was uh, thought that Jackson was a great painter, a, a great artist, and uh, she devoted herself to that proposition. What Lee did, she decided that uh, if he had some success, that he would have more confidence and he wouldn't get into these terrible depressions and drinking and so on. And I think it started out well when they moved here and it really worked out very well for a while. She cultivated everyone who could be helpful to him in a worldly way and rather isolated him from his real friends. And I think that was a mistake. As artificial as it is, I think this famous film is the most touching film ever of an artist working. It was a very unnatural, self-conscious, awkward process to make it. But every image of Pollock is full of tenderness. He agreed to paint on glass so the camera could be literally within a picture developing. Pollock had been on the wagon for two years, but he was driven back to drink by the pressure of making this film. At the end of the last day of shooting, he knocked back tumblers of whiskey and started shoving the filmmaker, Hans Namath. You're a phony, he shouted. I'm not a phony, you're a phony. But the fact is that the film was a lie. In his drunken rage with Namath, Pollock was expressing a real anxiety. He really couldn't work anymore. He'd reached a point where his ideas were just dried up. By the mid-50s, Pollock had had exhibitions in New York and all over Europe. His art was argued about by the most powerful critics in America. He'd been on the cover of Life magazine. He was world famous. And yet, he didn't know where to go. He said he'd been in life, but all he knew about was death. He didn't know what was happening to him. He was disoriented. He was in despair. He told Lee to think of his irascibility, his violence, his drinking as a storm that it would soon blow over. And then, on the night of the 11th of August, 1956, it did. Lee was in Europe, Pollock was in a car with Ruth Kligman, his lover, and Edith Metzger, Ruth's friend. It was an Oldsmobile he had just got in exchange for two small paintings. Pollock was driving and he was drunk. He was driving at 80 miles an hour. The car came to a curve in the road, a spot Pollock knew very well because it was only a few yards from his house, but he failed to slow down. Instead, the car sped into a group of oak trees. It ran up one of the trees and flipped over. Edith Metzger had been in the back, hanging onto the safety strap, calling out to Pollock to slow down, was rammed into the trunk of the car and crushed to death. Kligman and Pollock were each thrown from the car. Kligman suffered a fractured pelvis, but Pollock collided with a tree head first and was killed instantly. He was too sensitive to criticism, that was bad. I think he was someone so, so he had no skin to protect him, you know. Everything would, would get at him. And I think that the, the, the success was both good and bad because he had gained confidence but it was always exaggerated, you know, that he was the only painter and all that, which still was obviously insecure. Why do I not care about all the Picasso myths so much, but want all the Pollock myths? There's so many things already in Picasso's art, so few in Jackson Pollock's, just a misty space a sublime nothingness. We want the sublime, but we want it to be attached to something. If it's Turner, we want a storm at sea. With Pollock, we want the car crash. We feel we're really getting something then. 
the last big story of Pollock's life, his descent into chaos and death.